Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good morning, everyone. It's glad to, uh, we are glad to have you here. Today we have Kun Han, a PhD student in Ohio State University, and he is going to present his intern project, Emotion Detection from Speech Signals, with a stress on gaming scenarios. Without further ado, Kun, you have the floor. Okay, <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kun Han. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Ohio State University. Uh, it's my honor to be here for the summer internship. Uh, today I'm going to present my internship projects. It's the emotion detection for speech signal. Uh, at first, I would like to uh, thank all the people who give me help. Uh, at first, I want to thank the Conversational System Research Center, especially for my mentor, Ivan. And uh, uh, he hosts the, my internship for the whole summer. Uh, thank you very much. And also, uh, our thank Xbox team, they found my project and my internship. Thank you. Also, uh, I, I need to thank uh, Dr. Dong Yu, and uh, he gave me a lot of help on my projects, and uh, we have some very helpful discussion, especially on deep neural network. OK, let's move on to the uh, talk. Uh, this is the outline. Um, so at first, I will give a brief introduction for the project, and uh, then I will discuss some state of the art, some previous study, and uh, then uh, I will discuss some details for the approach, and uh, and then I will show some experimental results. The last part is the conclusion and uh, some uh, future work. Okay, so what is emotion recognition? So here, we focus on the emotion recognition from speech. So it means we want to extract the emotional state from uh, 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 emotional sta state of a speaker from a speech. So basically, there are two types of uh, uh, emotion recognition. The first one is the utterance level recognition. It means we uh, just uh, detect the emotional, emotional state from each sentence. Typically, the sentence is not very long, uh, maybe less than 20 seconds. So we assume that the emotion state in one sentence is constant. It doesn't change. So each sentence just has one emotional, uh, emotion level. And another is the dialogue level. So it's kind of uh, more than one people are talking. They're talking on some topic. So the emotional state can be changed across the time. So in this scenario, uh, people can use some temporal dynamics to capture the emotional state. In our work, we only focus on the first one, the utterance level. Uh, so there are some uh, applications on emotion recognition. Uh, since although we already make pro big progress on artificial intelligence, but we're still very far from a natural way to communicate with machine. So with because the machine doesn't know the emotional state of the speaker. So we can use emotion recognition to improve the experience of the users, especially in the human computer interface, in the gaming scenario. And we can use emotion recognition result, result to improve the gaming experience and also voice search and e-learning. And another important application is the monitoring and the control. In this scenario, uh, because some people work, work under the stress, for example, in the aircraft cockpit, we, it is very important that, that we need to know the emotional state of the pilot. So, okay. <coughs> so, uh, emotion recognition actually is still kind of new area. There are a lot of problems we need to solve. Uh, I list some of them. Uh, maybe it's there are also some other problems, but these three may be the most important. So the first one is the feature set. So it's not like the speech recognition. People know MFCC or PLP, some, some feature are 
very effective, but in the emotion recognition, we don't know which feature are effective for our task. So right now, what people are doing is just uh, blind trying different features, throw it to the classifier and get the results, but we don't know if this feature is effective or not. We just put all it together and get the classification result. And another the representation. So you can imagine that the emotion states is kind of like the color. So there are always some overlap between different emotions. So you cannot find the clear boundary between different emotion. You can, we cannot say, OK, this is the happiness, this is the excitement, and there is boundary. We cannot do that. So the overlap always exists. So the representation will be a problem here. And the third one is emotion actually is very highly dependent on the speaker and the culture. So different people have different style to express their emotion. So, so the emotion recognition system probably will consider this, this problem. Okay. Uh, OK, uh, now we can discuss some existing uh, studies. Uh, OK, the first one is the emotion labeling. So the simplest way, simplest way to, la uh, to label the emotion is use the category. It, we just pick some uh, basic emotions and uh, tell and label one of them, uh, like the happiness, sadness, anger, neutral, something. But as I said, we cannot find the clear boundary between different emotions. So some other study use the dimensional representation. It's kind of... Uh, treat each emotion as a coordinate on an emotional plane, like here. So, and there are two dimensions. One is the valence, it means the emotion is positive or negative. And another is arousal, means the emotion can be the active or passive. For example, the, the ang angry is a, positive, uh, is a negative emotion, but it's kind of very active. But the, Board. board is also negative, but this is the passive. So it's you, want, you don't want to say something. So you can label each emotion on this plane, and uh, uh, it's, so that, that's just a coordinate. And some, some other study use the third dimension, like the dominance, the tension, something. Um, but these two, this arousal and the valence, are very commonly used. Uh, our work actually just based on the uh, Essentially, it's based on the category uh, labeling. Um, but we also give the uh, score vector for each of the basic emotions. Uh, for the dimensional, although it's, it's a kind of a principal way to represent the emotion, but it's uh, not easy to explain. When you give a label, give a, it's just a coordinate. But explanation is, uh, is not uh, straightforward. <laughs> and also, some previous study the feature set in the previous study included the local feature and the global feature. So the uh, local feature essentially just uh, extract the feature from each frame, like the pitch magnitude, and uh, also some spectrum-based uh, feature like the MFCC, LPC, something. Also has some voice quality features like harmonic to noise ratio, jitter, shimmer. OK, so this is a frame level feature. But we need to make decision for each utterance. So we also need to extract the global feature based on this local feature. So the global feature is the combination of the local feature. So we just uh, collect the, all the local feature from one utterance. And then uh, a, a typical way to do it is just uh, computer statistics, like the mean standard deviation, maximum, minimum, to get the local, uh, global feature to represent the feature for the all utterance. So then different feature, we use different classifier. Uh, so basically, for the local feature, a uh, traditional way is uh, uh, using Gaussian, uh, Gaussian mixture model to, for each emotion and compute the uh, likelihood. 
and uh, some other people treated this as uh, uh, speaker I uh, it's very similar to the speaker ID. Uh, just use the GMM plus the uh, UBM and construct the super vector and then use SVM to do the classification. Also, you can use the uh, HMM to capture the temporal dynamics. And uh, uh, recent work used the LDA. They treated the each sentence corresponds to the document, and the each frame corresponds to the word, and uh, use the LDA to do the uh, classification. And the most uh, the recent work actually likes to use the global feature. Uh, they just uh, take the statistic across the whole utterance then uh, to the classification. The SVM is the most commonly used uh, classifier. And uh, also some people use the key nearest labor and the decision tree, something. And uh, also mm, most of the reason the study use the deep beneath network, but they still use this statistical feature to uh, uh, to to like like the do the feature extraction and then uh, use the SVM on top of that to extract the, uh, to estimate the emotion status. And uh, some database, uh, these are uh, commonly used in emotion recognition. Uh, uh, different databases, they have different source. Some, uh, some databases use the acted uh, acted utterance, and some use the actual recording. Uh, that is, they don't ask uh, actor, they just uh, record it. Uh, some emotional speech. Uh, for example, this one is it's the recording of the talk show. And this one is uh, ask some kids to talk to the Sony robot. So that is, uh, it's not uh, the acted uh, emotion. And uh, we use this one. Uh, I emo cap, uh, th uh, this one is uh, acted. They ask some actor to, to uh, pretend some emotion. Uh, and uh, this this database has the audio and the visual uh, signals. We only use audio here. And uh, the labeling is the categorical and the dimensional. And the, the, this database is very large and very rich, so that's why we choose this database. Other, other database is uh, relatively small. OK, let's go to our approach. So uh, this is the overview of the system. Uh, so, given the uh, utterance, okay, and uh, the first things we just uh, cut the utterance to different uh, segments, and then we extract uh, the feature from each segment. So we get the segment level features, and then we throw this segment to the deep neural network. We train deep neural network to estimate the emotion state of each segment. Okay, with this output, we get the segment uh, level output that is the Im can be the probability of each emotion state. But this is the segment level result. And we, for one utterance, we collect all the segment level results. And uh, we build, we compute the utterance level feature and uh, use another classifier to do the classification to make the utterance level decision. So this is a over. Did you find the segment? Yeah, I, I will talk about that. Yeah. Uh, OK, so uh, when we extract the segment feature, the first thing we need to do the framing, and we convert the signal uh, from time domain to the frequency domain. Uh, the window is 25 milliseconds with 10 millisecond step size. Uh, the feature here, we are uh, using the pitch-based feature, including the pitch value and the harmonic to noise ratio, and also MFCC features. Uh, also, we use data feature uh, cross time. And uh, then we can uh, build these segments uh, because the uh, uh, context information are very important. So we include uh, the frame before the current frame and the frame after the current frame. So totally it's 25 frame long. Th that is the, the segment. And we concatenate the feature from each frame and get this segment level features. So two questions. 
The feature set per frame is pretty much the standard speech recognition front end plus speech based features. It's kind of uh, okay. So now we have the segment level features XT. Uh, and when we train the neural network, we need to give the training label. Since the label is, we only have a label for every utterance. And here, essentially, we give all the segments from one utterance the same label. Uh, the label is from the utterance. Uh, and also, we don't use all the segments in the training data, because uh, utterance also contains something like the silence. We don't want to use that. And also, some speech, the, the energy is very weak. They may not contain much emotional information. So we also uh, throw that away. We just pick the top 10% segments with the highest energy for the training and the classification. OK, and uh, the output of the deep neural network will be the probability vector for each emotion in this uh, segment. Right. OK, this, uh, then, then deep neural network configuration here is we use the three hidden layer. We also try uh, one, two, three, four, and uh, three give, give me the best performance. And, uh, and the relative, uh, we don't need to go to the four or five. And they use rectify linear neural. And the uh, object function is cross entropy. And they use mini batch statistic uh, gradient descent to, to training. Uh, so this is very standard way. And so the deep neural network output will be, uh, will be here. The, if we have k different emotions, it will output the probability of each emotion. OK. OK, this is an example. Uh, so the, this is the blue, the, the blue line here represents the probability of, uh, there are five, emotion, uh, five emotions, excitement, frustration, happiness, neutral, and sadness, OK? So, Basically, for most of the segments, the excitement is uh, uh, gets the highest probability. And in some segments, they are not. But overall, it is the dominant, uh, this utterance. Uh, so yeah, functionally, this, uh, this sentence is uh, excitement. Uh, but not all the sentences have this good performance. Some sentences, when you plot that, it's very noisy. So we need to use another classifier to get the utterance level decision. OK. Um, so when we have the segment level output, we, we want to get the utterance level decision. So the, then for the utterance level classification, the input will be the utterance level feature. Uh, so first, we get the segment level output for each segment. And then we, we get this set of segments. We pick the maximal, minimal, and the, the mean for each emotion. Then this is the one type of feature. Another is we choose the number of the segments with the high probability. Uh, that means we want to know how many segments support this emotion. So that will be another feature. OK, we combine them together as the utterance level feature. And then we, uh, the outputs of the utterance level will be the emotion score vector for the whole utterance. Uh, when we do this, this classification, there are two uh, we try different classifier. The, of course, we, we use the SVM that was very uh, popular classifier. We also try another classifier called the extreme learning machine, and we will compare them. Okay, uh, a short discussion on the extreme learning machine. So, short for ELM. Uh, ELM essentially is the single hidden layer neural network. 
but with uh, uh, special training strategy. So uh, there are just one single layer. So from the weight from input layer to the hidden layer is just uh, randomly assigned. The weight is just random. And uh, from the hidden layer to the output layer, uh, we use minimal uh, we, uh, we use minimal least square error to train this weight. So I think the magic is here. We typical people typically use uh, this one. It's, it means we use the the number of hidden units is much much larger than the number of input units, so that the random projection from input to the hidden layer. When we have a lot of uh, hidden units, we can get the good representation for the training data. But also, since the weights are random, so this unit, uh, this hidden representation is not highly dependent on the training data. So it probably gives us a good generalization performance. So, so hold for one sec. How many, how, uh, how many features you feed to this extreme granular machine? How many? Uh, the, the input layer is actually just uh, uh, 20, 20 uh, input units. Five emotions mean uh, uh, mm, Yeah, what? so we have five emotions, so these are three, so three times 15? five, 15, and there, there are five 20. emotions. Yeah, so, so it's and 20. And how many, how many hidden? Uh, I tried different configuration, around like 100 uh, hidden units will be give us good performance. Uh, yeah, I also try uh, more hidden units. Uh, the performance uh, is is similar. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> uh, so for the train, what we what we will need to train is just uh, the hidden layer to the output layer. So uh, we use the minimal least square error and just minimize this. So it turns out uh, we just uh, need to solve this equation, this is a pseudo inverse. Uh, so it's a very fast, very efficient way to, to, uh, to do the training. And also essentially it gives us a good performance. Uh, so this is some advantage of this uh, uh, ELM. So there is no great descent, so it's very fast and uh, give a good generalization. And we also compare it with the support vector machine essentially it gets a better performance than SVM, and then it's much more efficient, around 10 times faster. Also, this EM has a kernel version. We also use kernel version, and we will do the comparison later. And uh, for the performance measurement, uh, so we use two types. Uh, measurements. The first one is the weight called the weighted accuracy. So uh, the weighted accuracy essentially is just the standard classification accuracy. Okay, use the correct label the uh, utterance divided by the, the number of all utterance. And the unweighted accuracy essentially for each for each class we compute the accuracy in this class and then we take the average of uh, of this accuracy. So essentially, it's, for this, this measurement, it kind of uh, it requires you get some balanced accuracy for each of the class, uh, each of the emotion classes. Okay, now uh, experimental results. So uh, this is the data set we are using. It's an uh, EmoCap database. It's the active multi-model, multi-speaker database, including the video, speech, motion, text transcription, something. And the each utterance is uh, actually annotated by three human annotators. So uh, they also use the uh, category and the uh, dimension labels. And the category, they use like eight to nine different category. So since there are three annotators, when we uh, build our corpus, we will see, we just select a sentence. If more than two an annotators give the same label to this sentence, then we will put them in our corpus. 
apparently if three annotators give different labels, we, we don't use that because we don't know the ground truth. Okay. Um, so in our corpus, we use uh, the happiness, excitement, sadness, frustration, and the neutral. Because these five emotions are uh, very commonly appeared in the gaming scenario. And uh, the training, the eight speakers, four male, four female, and the test is two speakers. They're not seen in the training set, so it's speaker, in, uh, speaker independent. And uh, we don't use a visual signal, we don't use text or transcription, just a uh, uh, speech signal. Um, I also want to mention that we don't use speaker normalization, because uh, some study, a lot of studies use speaker normalization. Uh, it, they normalize the feature for every speaker. So it means you, it assumes that you know the speaker ID, because when you normalize, them in the test phase, you need to know the normalization factor for each speaker, but we don't use that. Uh, some studies show that this speaker normalization can get very, uh, get much more, uh, very uh, large improvement, uh, but we just use this more challenging scenario. Okay, this is some gaming scenario. Uh, previously, we, uh, right now we have the clean speech, then we will create the uh, speech in the gaming scenario. Uh, so, so in the gaming scenario, we have a three uh, sound, uh, sound source. The speech is this speaker. They will say something, and we want to label the emotion for this guy. And also, we have uh, five loud speakers. They are playing movie, playing game, something, music and it has some background noise, like the air conditioner, some room noise. So all of these sound thoughts are captured by the Kinect. Uh, the Kinect has four microphones. So that is the mixture. Also, there are room reverberation. Because in this room, uh, there are re re reverberation in the room. So the human to the microphone uh, there are some reverberation and also loudspeaker. So they will convolve with the uh, room impulse response, get the mixture. And then uh, we use the Kinect audio pipeline to uh, attenuate this noise. So then we will get the processed uh, signal. So this signal will be used uh, in our uh, task. Okay. Uh, this is the configuration to create the gaming scenario corpus. The loudspeaker track included 10 different sound sources, five game, five movie. And uh, in this room, uh, so we try, uh, we use uh, 12 different uh, positions. So different position will <coughs> give different uh, <coughs> room impulse response. And <coughs> from uh, one meter to uh, four meters in the center, left, uh, right. <coughs> we just uh, random pick uh, position and mix uh, with the uh, uh, loudspeaker and also the background noise created the mixture. Also the sound level I randomly choose uh, from this. <coughs> <coughs> so this is an example and uh, I can play it. So this is a clean speech. God, I'm so excited, I'm like a kid. I can't believe I got out of the house, my fly zipped up. <laughs> this is a Kinect mix. God, I'm so excited, I'm like a kid. I can't believe I got out of the house, my fly zipped up. <laughs> this is a processed speech. God, I'm so excited, I'm like a kid. <clears throat> I can't believe I got out of the house, my fly zipped up. <laughs> so there are some distortion but uh, most uh, noise are removed. So we will use the clean speech and the processed speech. Uh, can anyone tell me what is the emotion of that utterance? I'll give you five options. Excitement, frustration, happiness, neutral, and sadness. I, I can play again if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Let me play again. God, I'm so excited, I'm like a kid. 
I can't believe I got out of the house, my fly zipped up. <laughs> you laughed at the end. There are five it's options. Excited, yeah. He said excited. Yeah. Yeah. I want to go with excitement. Uh, I, I want three answers, so. Okay. Uh, can Let's vote, let's vote. <laughs> excitement. excitement. I believe that it is excitement. Okay. Come. Yeah. Excitement, okay. And uh, anyone's fr uh, frustration? Sort of no frustration. <laughs> Happiness. Happy. Happiness? Happy. Okay. It's neutral. neutral. One neutral. Mm. Sadness? <laughs> okay, That's good. I, I, I think <laughs> most of your guys are good evaluators because the answer is we have three annotators, two give excitement, one give happiness. Well, so, pretty much labor, that the yeah. audience labeled it properly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. When they, when they annotate, do they see the video of the Yes, video? exactly. Yeah, they see the video. So there are some descript, uh, difference between if you only listen to the speech and when you li uh, also watch the video, maybe you give a different label. It is possible. Yeah. yeah it's interesting, even the words he says. It gives you a hint, I think. It's yes, not just yes. like yeah, yeah. Mm, yeah, that's the level of the, the way they're saying the words, it's the actual word. Yeah, and, and also essentially uh, video and a speech for different emotions, they have different uh, effects. Uh, for some emotion, you probably you are getting uh, the information from the vi uh, video, but for some emotion, maybe you are kind of captured the, the from. What? The annotator, do they understand the language they annotate? Uh, yeah, they, they use English, they, they know the, they know the, the yeah, they know the, the, the language. So at least subconsciously they use the meaning of the phrase. Yes, they, they use the, all the source we can get. Okay. So now we compare oh, our... I'm so sad right now. What? <laughs> will, it, will it think it's sad or is it excited? Uh, sorry? If it, in the same in the same sound, if it says it's sad, if it picks that up. If there is a controversy between the meaning and the yes. emotional. Yeah. Exactly. If you laugh at the end of the sentence, I'm sad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so sad. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it <laughs> so you will see as I change. Okay, so uh okay. So we uh, will compare our approach with uh, two different uh, uh, existing algorithms. The first one is the uh, uh, local feature with the HMM. Uh, HMM, they just uh, pick the frame level feature and uh, for each emotion, they train a uh, HMM hidden mark model and uh, then use the maximal likelihood to pick the uh, emotion. So we uh, train this one for each motion and we use the four fully connected states uh, for each motion and the uh, GMM to represent the observation probability and determine motion by the maximal likelihood. And uh, also uh, we compare with the global feature plus SVM. Uh, there is a tool kit called the open ear uh, this is very popular to kids in emotion recognition, and uh, they create a very, very large feature sets, the MFCC, pitch, LPC, zero crossing, and uh, blah, 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 around like eight to nine, ten, some different acoustic features. And for each feature, they apply the statistic function, the mean variance, skewness, kurtosis, maximal, minimal, and uh, whatever, a lot of statistics, so the, the feature set would be 988 dimensionality, <coughs> and then apply the SVM to the classification. So, so we compare these five, the HMM, open ear is its SVM, and uh, our approach, the deep neural network with the SVM utterance level classification, and the deep neural network with the extreme learning machine. This one, this guy is a uh, with uh, ELM using the kernel version. This is the result, it's the weighted accuracy. Uh, we show the clean speech result and the game uh, result in the gaming scenario. Uh, this side is the clean speech. So basically the HMM gets the lowest uh, performance and uh, 
the open ear is a little bit better. And uh, the DNA-based system is significantly better than these two. And uh, also, you can compare this SVM with the EIM. Uh, yeah, it's just a classification accuracy. We, uh, since we have five emotion, we just uh, count the number of uh, emotion correct uh, labeled, divided by the number of whole utterance. Okay. Yeah, just the standard uh, accuracy. Yeah. And what would be perfect accuracy? What number would this be? One. Uh, one. Uh, yeah. One. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Point five is something like. Uh, yeah. Yeah. This is not a very uh, very high number. Uh, the the highest number on this corpus uh, is like the 60 to 70, but they use the speech plus visual plus speaker normalization. Uh, so all the information together gets it like this number. And uh, also they use the four-way classification. Here we use a five-way classification. Uh, okay. A quick question. So when you calculate the accuracies, that one example you showed us where uh, two people had tagged it as, I think it was excitement, and one had tagged it as happiness, does that mean that this that is, it's a failure if you don't get both excitement and happiness? No, or is that, that for, for that one, the label in the training is excitement. Because two people. Yeah, yeah. Decided. We just choose the two people. So decision. if we, if you classified in your algorithm happiness, that would count as a failure. Yes. And what, like you, you made, you made your point around video plus the words spoken plus the audio really need to work in concert to get a really good mm -hmm. accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, have, what is the actual? Is there like a ground truth of if you just took audio? what a human could possibly do? Because that would be the best your algorithm could probably ever hope to achieve. Yeah, I always believe if you just take the audio, the, I mean, even you ask the annotator to do the label can be very different. It can be different. Yeah, yeah, but this corpus just provides the, the label is based on the audio and the audio and uh, the, the actually includes the text uh, transcription whatever, that kind of the, the true, we believe that is the true uh, emotion for this uh, uh, utterance. Um, but of course, this, this is not the really true ground truth because the, yeah, the labeling for the emotion recognition is still a problem. You, you always ask people to label the utterance thing, uh, but people always have different feeling for the emotions. Yeah, the, mm, yeah but the code which we can only base the uh, training or test uh, based on the, the label provided by the corpus. Okay. Mm. Okay, and uh, yeah, essentially, if you compare the clean speech and the gaming, uh, there are some decrease on average around 5%, but it's not very bad. It's, the, it's uh, five, around 5% 5 drop. And this the unweighted accuracy. It essentially, it's uh, you you need to get the kind of balance result for each classes. The basically the same trend you can find here, and uh, this is clean one. The HM is uh, even worse, and uh, the SBM is better, and uh, the DM based system is much better, and uh, also the 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 ELM is better than SVM. Uh, but overall, the EMM and the EMM with the kernel is uh, get pretty similar. Mm, it's they are comparable. Okay, uh, this is the confusion matrix. Uh, okay, this is the gaming scenario, this clean scenario, and uh, we have so this column is the true label is the label from the training set. This is the label from our uh, uh, approach. Uh, so you can see that uh, for the gaming scenario, on average, each accuracy is uh, it kind of uh, it's not different too much. It's different, but uh, not as large as the clean speech. And the very interesting thing is that um, if you compare this gaming and the clean, the 
the excitement, frustration, neutral, they get a very, very similar performance. This is a 0.5, 0.6, 0.36, they're very similar. But the happiness and uh, the sadness are very different. The clean speech gets very good performance for the sadness, but very poor for the happiness. But the gaming is uh, pretty much different. The, the happiness is good and the sadness is, is, uh, is lower. So the audio pipeline and the reverberation mask the sadness? Uh, the maybe. Sadness. <laughs> we should think about speech enhancement algorithm that enforces the sadness then. <laughs> <laughs> but when you play a game, maybe you always want the happiness. So actually it's better from the gaming scenarios. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to the conclusion and uh, discuss some future work. Uh, so basically we designed the uh, emotion recognition algorithm and we use the simplified uh, feature set and uh, use deep neural network for the segment level classification and uh, use the uh, ELM for the utterance level classification. And uh, our new approach achieved uh, outperform relatively 13% uh, to the uh, state-of-the-art previous studies. And in the gaming environment, we already see there are some negative effects on the emotion detection. Uh, there are around five drop, but still the new algorithm outperforms the state-of-the-art uh, around 13 relatively. Okay, and uh, I also want to mention some um, direction of the future work. Uh, the first one is the Go multimodal, and also there are three are somehow a technical one. Okay, uh, so basically right now the most corpus provide the speech and the uh, audio and the visual signal, and the sound provide the text transcription. So we previous study already showed that when we include the other information like the visual or speech, we can improve the uh, emotion recognition result significantly. Uh, so and the, right now they are available in the corpus. It's, so we can choose this multimodal information, and the visual information of course includes like the uh, gesture dynamics, and uh, also the face expression is very important to recognize the emotion. And also, uh, with speaker recognizer, we, we, if we know what they are saying, maybe we can also, oh, this, this will be another cue to do the uh, emotion recognition. Okay, then for some technical one, future work. So, because previous study we, uh, uh, in our approach, we use 10% segments with the uh, highest energy as a training and test sample. So because we believe that this strong segment contains more emotional information, they are informative for our task. Uh, but this, we, we, we choose this 10%. But the question is, can we determine this informative segment directly from learning? The idea is we can, we can choose the best uh, training sample from the last uh, trained model. When we get this best uh, training sample, we throw that to the next uh, model to the training. Then, then the next model gets the better training sample, and uh, uh, so we just uh, throw away those no, uh, non-informative segments. So principally, this new model should give us a sharper probability because the, we have a better training sample, then the, the trend model should, should give a better performance. And this is the idea of this. We first get the whole training set and uh, then train DNN. And uh, with this DNN, we get the, training, uh, the second training set. This training set are chosen from this one. And then we keep training, do this for a few times. And uh, with this trend DN in the test phase, we just uh, 
throw the speed to all of them and uh, do the combination. Maybe we can get a better performance. I have some preliminary results. Uh, so, so with this hierarchical training with, uh, versus the ordinary training, the, uh, for the unweighted accuracy, they get like a 2% better performance. The weighted are pretty similar. Uh, this, uh, this improvement is not very large, but I still believe there are some work we can do, like uh, how to choose the best sample and uh, how to combine the different uh, DNA model together and get the good uh, utterance level performance. And uh, also, uh, we, we, we should, we should improve, uh, incorporate some temporal dynamics because pre previously the HMM is trained uh, under the unsupervised manner. We don't have the label. We just, uh, for each uh, emotion, we train the HMM. But here, when we, we have the DNN, it can give the label for each segment. Then with this initial label, we can use the supervised manner to train the uh, HMM principally is to give me the better performance than the HMM, maybe better than in our approach, it's possible. Also, uh, this one is actually at the very beginning, I, I uh, do some work on this one, it's kind of very interesting. Because right now, the problem of emotion recognition is that we pick the handcraft feature, like MFC, PLP, whatever, and together to as a feature to train the system, but uh, uh, essentially from the machine learning point, uh, it is possible to use the spectrum feature because spectrum doesn't lose any information. Everything is in the spectrogram, and also motivated by recent progress in speech recognition, they successful to train uh, speaker recognizer using uh, field bank. So. Uh, Maybe in the emotion, we can still directly train on the spectrogram and uh, let the learning machine to learn every f all the feature and then do the training. Uh, but in my experiment, it's not very good result. It's uh, frame level accuracy is uh, lower than in the MFCC plus pitch, around 4% lower. Um, but it's worth trying. Uh, Maybe we can try different uh, parameters like the window length or something. And also maybe more data will benefit for the DNA training. Uh, okay. That's it. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, some important reference. And uh, yeah, pretty much done my presentation. And uh, I want to share this one. Uh, I have been in US for a few years, and uh, I would say uh, this summer is the most wonderful summer I have had in US. And uh, this picture is t uh, was taken a few weeks ago. Uh, I spent two days to climb the mountain Adams. It's uh, 12,000 feet, and uh, it's very hard, very cold, but uh, it is very, very nice experience. And there's no sound and no voice here, but if you only look at the picture, if you look at my, look at my face, my emotion is very, very excited. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Come questions, please. No questions? No emotions? Have you tested the algorithm of real data besides uh, active data? Uh, the actual data, you mean? So, um, the algorithm you, in the, the, in the presentation, you tested on active, um, you know, yes. corpus. Yes. Have you tested it on real data? Uh, I, I didn't systematically evaluate it, but uh, I test on uh, the data from the same corpus, but it's uh, the actual data. There are some drop, um, don't remember the name, but uh, not very worth. There are, there are some drop, yeah. I mean, if you want to, if you really want to treat with the actual data, you, you may need to train on the actual data. But here but we, we just train. The data is provided by your team. Where can you <laughs> find to test yeah. it? <laughs> 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 so I was wondering whether you or somebody 
did the same work with uh, uh, additional state which is unknown. In neutral, it's not unknown. Okay, so unknown is, for example, all those samples that out of all the three liberals mm -hmm. gave different. Yes. Okay. So you, you're trying to get rid of this. Yeah, yeah. Saying why, why not to use them? Uh, because many, many times when somebody says something, I have no idea what the emotion is. Uh, yeah, you are right. So, yeah, if, uh, if, yeah, you, yeah, you can believe that if three annotator give different uh, labels, then maybe this emotion is uh, very difficult code to, to describe, or, uh, but it's still some particular emotion. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, but in, in, in our experiment, I just uh, I sort of... Just yeah. curious to try it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's very interesting. I, <laughs> I haven't thought about that. It's, yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, it's still some emotion, but we don't know what it is. Yeah. In, yeah. in, your, in your test with, um, with the sound in the background, mm -hmm. does it does the algorithm algorithm change? I'm I'm just thinking about people sometimes speaking loudly, like they speak they speak up louder when they think that like something can't hear them. Mm -hmm. So if I have something running in my background, I'm trying to talk to the connect. Mm -hmm. My I might sound more excited or something because I'm trying to project. Mm -hmm. Did that kind of thing come out, or was it was it very? Did it not really change? Like you could still detect the emotion even if somebody was trying to be more emphatic. Uh, I mean, with the background, the, the background uh, maybe masked the, the what you are saying. The, the background, because because of the background noise, they might be changing the way they're talking to the machine because they're trying to talk over it or try, try to talk over the sound in the background. So this is called Lombard effect, and no, we didn't account for that. Oh, okay. So technically, yes, people speak differently when if there is a loud sound, they try to get more energy through. What the corpus is, is just pure synthetic. You get the clean recording, you convolve it with the impulse response, you add the reverberation, you add the noise, but it's the same voice regardless of the loudspeaker levels. And that may affect actually the precision of the classification. You had mentioned at the beginning that different cultures express themselves in different mm -hmm. ways. Mm -hmm. Your data corpus, though, had German and yeah. United States averaged together. Yeah. Did you see, like, were yeah, you actually, like substantially better with Germans versus this United This is States? a very interesting question because uh, I, I haven't did this experiment, but some previous experiment already they picked different languages together, like the German, English, Spanish, something together, and the performance is still very good. Uh, but if you test on different culture like the Chinese, Japanese, then, then the performance are very different. So it means, because you can, the, the English or Spanish German, they are kind of very similar to each other. And uh, in the emotion part, they are maybe have a similar way to express their emotion. But uh, if the language are very different, then, then the system may not work for the others. Language. So, you yeah. have, so you didn't get deep into that then, where you would make a recommendation, oh, for every language or every country uh, language uh, pairing that you should have a different training set? Yeah, for, uh, of course, for different languages, if you train on particular languages, you, you will get a good performance. But uh, for, for me, I think you can put the similar language together and uh, train the emotion, uh, train a system, okay. and uh, the other different uh, multiple languages to get another model. That would be good, I think. This might be an interesting place to go deeper in your next steps, like to really dig into the differences regionally yeah. in different yeah. locales. Yeah, because the emotion is not very, well, not highly dependent on the language. Even you don't understand the language, you can still say that he's happy or sad or something. Yeah. So there, there are no language dependent features. It's more cultural difference. Let's say Italian speaking Norwegian, it will be, you better use the Italian language setups because the guy is uh, culturally is more excited with more emotions in the speech. Uh, well, the opposite case, uh, Norwegian speaking Italian, you know, you'll see the same kind of even tone in different uh, uh, difficulties to recognize the two emotion. And those are the, all examples from Europe, and just, if you start to cross, go across races and continents, it's getting even, even more different.
So it's more cultural than language dependent. I see. Okay. And eventually it's possible to find some, let's say, some large general training data and to do some adaptation towards this culture is more emotional, less emotional, to find some coordinate system. But for now, what it, the state the state is, is you have to have a label of data for each language in the country. Means uh, Spanish uh, in Spain may be different than Spanish in Mexico. More questions? So let's give Kona.